Hi, everyone. Welcome to the next session in our State of the Consumer Summit, titled How Brands Can Stay Relevant in an Increasingly Diverse World. I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer here at Suzy, and joining me today is a panel of leading industry and educational experts discussing their insights, along with relevant real-world scenarios. So before we get started, I would love for everyone to get to know each other a little bit better. Please tell me a little bit more about yourself, your work, but also outside of the market research field also. And Michelle, I'd love to start with you. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Escar, and I manage marketing and experience at Panasonic, working specifically on the consumer product family. Uh, and I live in New Jersey, although I'm from New York, and I have two little ones at home. Awesome. Sonia, please introduce yourself to the audience. Hi, I'm Sonia Thompson. I'm a customer experience strategist and consultant. Um, I have been helping clients um, do more research uh, as of late, helping them specifically with um, moderation for doing uh, engaging with their diverse and Latinx communities. Uh, I live in Florida with my family. We just moved from Buenos Aires earlier this year. Um, so my Argentine husband, our Argentine dog, and our uh, bilingual baby. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Dr. Joel, see if you can beat that one. <laughs> I can't. I can't. Let's just call it what it is. Um, uh, thank you. So I'm uh, Joel Meyer. I'm a professor of marketing at the University of Richmond here in lovely Richmond, Virginia. Um, I have been a practitioner uh, of research and insights and strategy for more than 30 years, having worked a lot in Silicon Valley at Adobe and at Netflix, and then a few firms there on the East Coast. And I have the great pleasure of consulting with other firms, trying to help them uh, uh, increase and accelerate their journey of customer centricity, right? really harnessing uh, and unleashing the power of customers into their business processes. And uh, finally, I told you I can't beat it. I've got two uh, adorable puppies at my feet and they may get active in a minute. So I just want to let everybody know that could happen. <laughs> That's fun. Good luck with puppies. <laughs> and last but very much not least, Elliot. I like that. Um, hi, I'm Elliot Rosen. Uh, I do innovation in the media and personal care portfolio at Unilever, which is a really, it's a lot of words. What it means is I use data, voice of the consumer, insights, trends, and all that jazz to come up with new brands and products. While I haven't been working in consumer research for decades, like Dr. Joel, um, I'm definitely putting it to practice. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, so tons of the work that he's done at companies have you know, started a fire inside of me that um, I'm out here learning and I can't wait to learn from each of you. Fantastic. I think we'll all agree. What an amazing panel uh, we have today. Brands, consumer electronics, CPG, educators, strategists, super looking forward to the, the discussion as we go through. So we'll go ahead and we'll get started with the, well, the, the big picture. So uh, it has been quite the last uh, year, two years. And I'd love to know a little bit more about how insights and the function of insights to brands has really shifted just specifically, first of all, in those, in those last 24 months. And I'd love to get started with you, Sonia. What I've started to see are brands are starting to get more specific with asking about how uh, race and ethnicity has started to impact the way consumers are experiencing or going through customer experiences, how they feel they're treated, how that even impacts how they choose which brands they are starting to choose or align themselves with. Previously, uh, I think that people or brands were using um, race and ethnicity as markers in their segmentation, but they weren't necessarily exploring the role that that played in their everyday lives. And they're now starting to understand that consumers can't don't compartmentalize their lives in that way. And consumers really have started to just um, become more vocal in wanting brands to acknowledge that they are different and acknowledge from um, what's happening in society. And so that has caused a lot of change. Yeah, I can't wait to double click on a lot of what you just said there as we go through today's discussion. <laughs> Michelle, uh, what about yourself? How has the last 24 months been for you? Yeah, you know, what I found really interesting is that we typically used to do our insights work sort of ahead of purchase. So trying to understand who is interested in something 
um, who our potential customers were. But where we weren't necessarily following up was really understanding who's happy with a product versus not as happy. Like where did we not where did we not meet expectations correctly? Um, and I think diversity comes into play there. And you may have a very diverse group of people who are potentially interested, um, but not necessarily the same reaction. And now that we have kind of empowered the consumer with reviews at their fingertips, the second they look at a product, it's so important that you really follow all the way through and understand not just interest, but actual satisfaction. Yeah, that's super important. Elliot, what about a, a Unilever or outside of Unilever? I think, there's been a huge paradigm shift. So I think in the process of consumers adopting a lot more digital customer journeys, I think that's kind of, and it's also a mixture of like, we've all been on our laptops working from home and taking digital a lot more seriously in our workflows. So I think that's like re-engaged, not just cons consumer research teams, but throughout the organization to like reevaluate the marketing technology that we're using um with the ultimate goal of like meeting consumers where they are and delivering products that they want and experiences that they value yeah i couldn't agree more and finally joel mm. you know the thing that i've noticed with clients and, and observing firms is you know given given how challenging the past 24 to six months have been for us uh, at, at the macro level what I have seen of firms really valuing to an extent I haven't seen before, the, the richness and the thickness of qualitative research. So the need to not just go, oh, you're happy, you're unhappy, or you're satisfied, you're dissatisfied, but to really dive in deep and get that emotional connectivity and understand that richness. And so, you know, I'm a huge believer of mixed methods and, and there's no one right methodology, they're all right. And so I'm really happy to see this continue to grow and, and have this be better represented in organizations. Yeah, yeah. So with a lot of those changes in the past 24 months, whether it's tools um, or, or how brands start connecting, do we think all of these changes are, are here to stay or are any of them temporary? I think it's them? difficult to go backwards. I definitely think that once you try new things that work, and I do think a lot of these shifts to digital weren't purely to make up for the fact that we've been working from home or consumers have been shopping from home. I do think that there is a value for both corporations or firms and also for consumers themselves. So I think the process of rolling backwards is highly unlikely. I think rolling forwards, we haven't seen this level of acceleration and speed probably in, in many industries. I don't think e-commerce has had a jump like this, at least in Western markets. I think we're mimicking something that we saw with SARS in the Asian e-commerce market, but now on a global level. So I think the likelihood of rolling backwards is very low. I think the difficulty now is there's expectations across the board um, for moving faster and delivering more, more things, whether it's buy now, pick up in store, whether it's legacy companies that used to only sell through retailers moving to e-commerce or direct to consumer, um, all of these things, um, we think it's been moving fast, but it'll only move faster over the next decade. Yeah. Does anybody else have an opinion on if there's anything that you think is only temporary? Or are we all in alignment that it looks like these changes are here to stay? Excellent, excellent. I think they're here to stay, Katie. I think they're absolutely, I think they're absolutely here to stay. Uh, a lot of the things that we've witnessed were already in momentum, to, with relatively some small, some medium, and this just accelerated the hell out of it, right? And then in result of the offerings that we now have as consumers, um, they're, they're more, uh, they're, they're rich, there's more options and, and we're not gonna regress, right? We've learned the benefit of these, these, these new techniques or approaches or methodologies or ways of thinking and um, we're going back. Gene's out of the bottle, thank goodness. <laughs> For sure. And I, would, I would say our capability around psychographic understanding, you know, going beyond demographics and really digging into someone's values um, that's only going to continue to grow and accelerate, right? I mean, we're hopefully as a society progressing past those hard demographic lines. And so 
um, I think we'll keep getting stronger, stronger understandings and we'll stop grouping people together traditionally and group them together in ways that really are meaningful. Definitely hold that thought because we're coming to that exact topic. <laughs> Before we get to the consumers and everything that you just you just mentioned there, uh, Michelle, let's quickly uh, talk about you know we've seen a digital adoption digital adoption amongst consumers, but on my side of the house, we've seen digital adoption from our clients as well. So where tools and and on demand tools were becoming popular the last twelve months, definitely accelerated that. So before we get into the consumer area, I'd love to just find out a little bit more about um, you guys, your guys' use of on-demand market research tools um, and, and how that's been able to help you to support some of that more rapid decision making. Um, and Michelle, we'll start with you. Yeah, um, actually it's so relevant recently because we've just, it used to be, um, I mean, I, I work for a hundred year old Japanese company, right? There's loads of red tape, there's a lot of process, understandably, and of course we're constantly evolving, but um, we've realized that we, we can't really wait months, you know, for an approval, for a sign up for everyone just to get the research going. There's a lot of times where there's just a really quick decision where in a meeting, um, something as simple as, you know, what color bristles should be on the toothbrush. Um, and, and rather than us argue about it internally or guess or take opinions or we just want to know right then and there from the customer. Hey, which of these statements do you agree with? And then we can move forward. So I think from an operational efficiency perspective, it's it's so necessary. Um, and every your competitors are, are doing the same, right? So you'll actually fall behind um, if you're not on top of that trend. Yeah, fast insights are definitely a competitive advantage in today's yeah. market. Um, Elliot, obviously you're being brand side, also would love to hear from, uh, from you a little bit more about your kind of digital adoption of, of market research tools and how they've helped you get closer to the consumer. So traditionally, like my background is in performance and growth marketing, where we use tons of different channels to the end of acquiring users, retaining them, engage them and monetizing them. I think the point that like radicalized me is one day I woke up and I realized that all of those channels and the work you're doing in them are also consumer research, or they could be, you could take this arsenal of tools that you have and flip them from performance marketing to consumer research and have a feedback loop. Um, so I think what we're seeing now is as performance marketing, where it once was kind of like a skill that was hidden in small startups or exclusive to tech companies, it's now kind of it's a lot, it's a commoditized service and everyone is taking it seriously because growth is you know, one of the top three priorities for every company nowadays. But I think we're gonna see is people are gonna do, everyone likes to talk about testing and experimenting. It's kind of like the, the topic de jure of every company. How can we create an experimental mindset or an experimental culture? But now that everybody has verbalized that, they have that in their head, they've intellectualized it, we get it. Now it's time to really see that put into action, especially at larger companies, right? Because like they always see things like brand and product as their darlings and they need to learn how to, to kill those darlings and get insights and make better decisions instead of relying on expertise alone or experience and um, seniority alone. Yeah, yeah. We talk about the hippo, uh, at Susie. Don't feed the highest paid person in the yeah, room. Yeah, but my, mine's the <laughs> mine's the zebra. So I think the yes. counterpart to the hippo is the zebra, which is zero evidence but really arrogant, which you yep. see all the time, right, mm -hmm. within larger corporations, and for good reason. I think that tons of large corporations, and I, I know that everyone on this call can speak to this, is there are people who are visionaries and big thinkers and decision makers who can use gut. I don't think every decision has to come down to science and data. There is a level of alchemy and magic that goes into decision making. However, you have to find the balance between the two and that's where really cool things happen. Yeah, yeah I agree. I mean, I think there's also, there's a big difference between gut and opinion, right? Mm -hmm. So like your gut is based off of that, the right audience and what you're learning and you're putting it together a picture and you're thinking empathetically. Opinion is a very personal um, tool that maybe may or may not apply to the audience or to what you're trying to achieve. And so I definitely, it's very difficult, I'm sure for all of you to get through, uh, let's say a marketing decision meeting where you don't start to hear opinions. Mm -hmm. um, and, <laughs> and so constantly being armed with that data, um, even like like to the moment data where you can support 
uh, and come back in and say, you know, that's great that that's your experience, but this is what we're seeing in the data and you can't argue with that. And the more rapidly we can acquire the data, the more robust that gets, the, um, the more we get away from those opinions. Yeah, absolutely. Susie, we've definitely seen a lot of new departments and new teams coming to us for faster insights, teams such as merchandising teams, revenue management teams, you know, historically it was mostly either marketing or consumer insights. Um, has the need for insights within your organizations changed? Are you getting a lot more departments come to you to ask for that consumer feedback? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and it, a lot of it is, um, honestly, a, a lot of it is thanks to the prevalence of online reviews. It's because now anyone in the company from top to bottom has absolute full visibility um, of to what people are saying about our products. Um, and so when there is a bad review, that's, you know, all the way from executive, what happened here? Well, you know, how did that happen? How do we stop that from happening in the future? Um, and I think a couple of years ago, it was very defensive. It was how do we comment on that review? And, and <laughs> yeah. that, right, it was, and, and that never really worked, right? It was just something we could do to make people happy and feel like we did something. The truth is it has to be proactive, not reactive for it to be effective. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, and final, go, sorry, go ahead. So, Katie, one thing I just want to mention, one of the things that um, I think has really helped accelerate within the enterprise, um, the need and the value are, you know, some newer methodologies that we've seen come out in the last 10 years. And I don't mean research methodology, I mean business methodology in terms of agile, design thinking, lean, which are based upon rapid experimentation, right, imperfect information, engaging and getting feedback rough prototyping, all these things that we've kind of talked about. Well, now they're business approaches and we have agile accounting, we have agile marketing, we have agile everything. And so it's been really interesting to watch that as a little bit of a ground cover, plant seeds all over that, mixed metaphors, of course, but mixing seeds everywhere. But it helps demonstrate the value that quite frankly, every business in the history of time is there to create value for some other person in one way, shape, or form. And we need to get off our pedestals and realize that we should engage the people we're trying to serve to help make better solutions and not just sit here and go, well, I'm really smart and I'm really bright, so I'll make decisions. That, that's foolish. And if you embrace and maintain that mentality, you're going to be extinct in the next decade, right? It's just going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. So moving on from the tools, let's get into the good stuff. <laughs> let's talk about the shifting demographics of, of the USA and, and who these people are that we're talking to and wanting to engage with. The 2020 census obviously showed us that the USA is becoming increasingly multicultural, although disappointing that the census only asked the gender question with two answer options, male, female. It's definitely a topic for a future webinar of ours. Uh, and we have a blog post coming out on, on exactly that topic. And I hope to get into some of that with, with you folks today. So let's let's start with it. Why why do you think market why why do you think sorry diversity is so important in, in market research? And Sonia would love to start with you. <laughs> The consumers are, are changing, right? And they want to know that the brands that they are engaging with see them, understand them, and they get them. Uh, and if we take a one-size-fits-all approach or continue with a one-size-fits-all approach, people are going to feel left out. They're not going to see themselves. They're not going to feel seen or like they belong. So taking the time to acknowledge uh, the people that you're serving and what their differences are helps them know that you have taken the time to develop products, services, and experiences that are specifically for them. Anytime you go and engage the brand and you feel seen, um, it's, it's one of those things that makes you want to tell other people. Uh, I like to use the example um, a couple of years ago for Black History Month. Um, one of my girlfriends went into Target and she saw immediately the Black History Month display. And she snapped a picture and she sent it in our group chat and it was like, look, and she was so excited. I went to Target the other day and I saw their um, display for Hispanic Heritage Month. And I smiled because I'm thinking about my daughter. And just those little things from time to time will help you understand that this brand gets it. They know that I've got differences that are worth being um, acknowledged and catered to. Yeah, absolutely. 
And Dr. Joel, as an, as an academic, why is diversity so important in market research? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think um, trying to get at, and I'm glad you mentioned psychographic here, Michelle, but trying to get at kind of the true essence of who you are, not as a, uh, uh, not as you know, an overly simplistic label, but kind of the depth of who you are as a person allows us to better understand and identify opportunities that then allow us to, you know, uh, address those needs. And it could be the product, it could be the campaign, it could be a host of things. But, but the more, in essence, the more we can understand you as an individual and all that that entails, the better that we're able to then connect with you. And, and our challenge as, a, as an enterprise is going to be to do so authentically, right? Every brand cannot connect with every person authentically. It's not possible. And so who are those that we um, were able to and, and want to uh, that, that there we could authentically meet their needs? So I think it's just it, it's the it's, it's about time that we finally are recognizing this because it's been there the whole time. It's just we are finally catching up and realizing, wow, this is really important because it, it, it is. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to go so deep on this. There's so much to talk about. Um, thinking about diverse, you know, the people you're talking to, right? So thinking about diverse audiences to reflect those demographic shifts in the USA. And I was at SampleCon very recently where we talked about the gender question in surveys um, and how if you're simply asking male, female, who are you excluding? Um, and not just who you're excluding, but how do consumers who see that question as being so black or white, feel about that brand that's asking that question. So my question to, to you folks is, who are we getting insights from and how do people classify themselves and how are we classifying them in market research? And again, I'm going to start with you, Sonia. It's interesting because I think we're starting to use a lot more labels uh, and finding out that the labels that we're using aren't always what people want to be labeled. Uh, I was doing some research um, recently and I was talking to um, some the other person who I was interviewing and I had to ask, do you consider yourself a person of color? And she's like, uh, I say multiracial. And so if she sees the label person of color, although she could qualify in that demographic, that's not how she describes herself. Um, and there are, we need to, have a better understanding of the way people classify themselves, not what we as industry folks want to kind of put people in different compartments and that helps us sort of categorize them. So thinking about um, how the consumers are changing across the board and there are a number of different ways in which they are, um, making sure that we take the time to understand how they see themselves, how they want to be referred to, how, um, those differences impact the way they think and, and receive messages that we're sending out as brands is, is essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've seen a lot of the word other being utilized. So male, female, other ethnicities and other. And I was yeah. re only recently thinking to myself, how would I feel if I had to select other? You're the other. And yeah. And so I understand that brand was trying to be inclusive and kind of like, oof, the fact you've had to select other is maybe also potentially very problematic. <laughs> Michelle, I know you have a lot of thoughts here also. Yeah, well, you know, I think there's there's kind of two components to this, right? Um, there's there's a, a value system as a company, right? And if you want to genuinely um, cater to as many people as possible and not exclude anyone, then it's essential, right? That, that you're researching all those groups. And so that comes down to your values as a brand. And if you do that incorrectly, then you're basically improperly communicating um, your core values. I think the other part is actually very just, just practical. Um, when we advertise, we don't target, you know, black males 24 to 26. We target people who are interested in hip hop. We target people who um, follow a series of TV shows. We, uh, we, don't, we don't really target by demographics anymore. We target by interest and by lifestyle. And so why would we survey by demographics if we're targeting by lifestyle, right? We should be surveying by the same things we're going to target. But I mean, that's, that's just logical. Um, so, so to me, it's a little bit of both of those buckets. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a lot of conversations in, in market research around quotas. And again, it's 51% female, 49% male. But I'm like, does that really even apply? Why? Today? Why? why? And does it even apply? And why does, why does gender really, really matter? If I have people across a wide spectrum of gender and they all say their favorite color is blue, great. We're going to make it blue. It doesn't <laughs> matter who said it was blue. 
Yeah, absolutely. And as you mentioned, diversity goes beyond just race, ethnicity, gender, etc. But it's also body shape and type, neurodivergence, um, and so on. Um, I'd love to know, you know, Elliot, you work in the beauty and personal care space. Um, what kind of areas of, have, you, have you been leaning into um, as it comes to talking to the right people and, and making sure you're classifying or not classifying them correctly? I've been smiling because this topic gets me so tight because I think mm -hmm. that there's like two sides to it, right? There's like a, a discussion of demographics as we know them need to be thrown out and we need to redefine them. I think my example for that is Prince Charles and Ozzy Osbourne are in many ways the same demographic. Affluent yep. white straight males who live outside of London metropolitan area. I couldn't pick two people who are more different than those two. <laughs> and psychographically would be a much better way to target them. I think where it hits a wall with the argument that demographics have to be thrown out is, and it's a very nuanced line, and this is why I think everyone should hire a Sonia, is there comes a point where, oh, oh we kind of do need a demographic solution here. So how are these people defining themselves? Is there an evolution in the standard set? Is the drop down menu just missing too many options? Are we not putting our ear to the ground and saying that the way that we've looked at this in the 20th century with a set number of lists is just a fallacy to begin with? And we have to start working on defining demographics around how people are self-selecting. And I think the example I always give to maybe conservative people or naysayers to the idea that there are many genders is go ahead and launch a CZ survey and tell me and like people aren't clicking a third, a third or fourth one. And you know, mathematically you're incorrect. There are more genders. People are self-selecting them into a new set list of genders. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe emotionally you're not so okay with this shift, but like they exist. It's not a theoretical thing. It's yeah. not something that's happening in classrooms across America. It's not a youth thing. It's you're preparing for a new drop down menu and you yeah. better be prepared. So I think the problem is, is a lot of conservative organizations aren't hiring the right people to come in and help them define that nuanced line because it is very nuanced. It's super emotional. It's super delicate. So higher Sonia is, is <laughs> I, I want to build upon that. Um, it is there. Are, there are times where not thinking about the demographics are very important, but there are other times where they matter. And if you don't, you're not going to you're going to miss some elements. So a lot of times as brands, for instance, are thinking about representation and advertising, um, they might want to put um, quotas of the different types of people that they're going to put from a visual imagery standpoint. I did a Susie survey um, earlier this year about representation and marketing. And whenever I looked at what everybody across the board said, um, skin color and ethnicity did not make the top five or the top three. But whenever I broke that down by the African-American population or the Asian population, skin color popped up and people were very vocal in the verbatims about what that meant to them um, and how they talked about there were not enough dark skinned people of color that they were seeing both black and people of color. We wouldn't have gotten that if we didn't look at the data upon um, different demographics to see how their responses were different. We just would have thought, oh, skin color isn't so important on the whole from a representation mm -hmm. standpoint. So it's, it's helpful to see directionally, if you running survey, um, look at, does the answer change across the board whenever you're looking at the general population? Or if you run it for um, how different groups responded, if you don't see any type of difference, then okay, then it's not really something that is important. But if you do start to see major changes in how people are responding and what they're saying is important, then you definitely should dig into that a little more because it is a great signal that you might need to approach your marketing in a different way, in a way that will speak to different groups um, on a more emotional level. Yeah. And Sonia, you bring me to a really good point. Um, before that, I would just double click on what Elliot mentioned. You said that yeah, it's not just the youth that define themselves differently. These people have always been there. We've just been ignoring them. <laughs> it's time to to really stop, you know, stop stop with the ignorance, really. Um, Sonia, but as you were kind of uh, speaking there, what I really kind of heard from you is it's important that the person who is asking the questions um, 
should probably understand the demographic makeup of the audience they're talking to as well. Are we asking the right questions and analyzing the data the right way? You know, personally myself, I've worked in beauty and personal care in the past. I definitely could not write a survey about cars or automotive. I know nothing about the topic and I would not be the right person to design a survey. But are we therefore not necessarily looking, you know, are we not looking deeply enough at who's writing the surveys, who the moderators are in qualitative research and who's analyzing that data to make sure that we are representing uh, and asking the right questions in the first place? I think it's important because it, there's a degree of cultural intelligence that you need to help you understand what are the areas that we need to explore. Uh, if Let's use the colorism example in particular. Um, if that isn't part of your world or if you haven't sort of immersed yourself significantly, that might be an area that you just wouldn't know to explore or ask those questions. So making sure that you have a different set of eyes or people who are represented representative of the people that you're trying to get insights from is helpful because they can understand if there are certain areas where you need to dig a little deeper on, um, if some of the uh, phrasing isn't, um, isn't quite right from a, a cultural standpoint. Um, my husband and I worked on a project earlier this year where we were looking at things from um, a language, a Spanish language standpoint and understanding what the experiences that were delivered or the way that we're describing things from a Spanish language um, standpoint, culturally acceptable. Is it being received in the right way? Um, there were things that I can look at it. I'm not a native, I'm not a, I'm a Spanish speaker, but I'm not native, right? So there are things that I wouldn't pick up that he would. So it's always helpful to, to um, have someone who was a part of the community that you're trying to get information from to help you with those questions, making sure that they're right. But sometimes as you're doing one-on-one -on -one interviews, it is helpful to have people who look like the person that you are interviewing on the other side, because there are connection points that people will give more in-depth or more open responses sometimes because there is a natural comfort level uh, that they might not get. They might be more polite, more reserved with someone who they don't necessarily feel has a shared experience or um, will get them. So thinking about even who your moderators are is essential because you might get a different um, level of depth and quality of your insights um, and the responses that you get depending upon how people connect with the person on the other side of the screen or who is in front of them. Yeah, it's so true. So, and we talked about this last week. I hadn't really thought about it. And you know, now it's definitely top of my mind as well. Again, at SampleCon recently, Dr. Jake Bennyhoff mentioned um, that a lot of companies miss misrepresent and, and think that Spanish marketing means just translating into Spanish language. And it's really <laughs> not at all. Michelle, I'd love to, to, to hear from you also. What advice do you have for brands that might be, um, you know, trying to appeal to a more diverse audience and what should they do to get to know their consumer? Yeah, I think it kind of goes back to um, what uh, Dr. Joel was uh, alluding to before around that balance between quantitative and qualitative research. Um, you know, quantitative surveys are kind of easier to run typically and they're faster, but um, especially where you're trying to really deeply understand an audience, um, I think that it you're probably not necessarily asking all the right questions. And the only way that you find that out is by actually having those conversational sessions where whether it's one-on-one -on -one or small groups where uh, you really get to dive deep and dig in and explore and learn more. And why did you answer this this way versus this way? It gives you all of those insights up front, which honestly, I mean, think about how many times you run a quantitative survey and then you read the results and something doesn't make sense and you have to follow up with another quant and another quant before you finally uncover what it is that that you were seeing um and that would all have come in probably in an interview with one person right would have revealed that entire background and where that comes from so um i think that balance is so important and sonia's point about who your moderators are and being being um relatable and uh, that's so unbelievably true and i think that's something a lot of people don't think about during those um, quantitative, qualitative sessions. And certainly, um, I've seen a, a thousand times in, in a, a smaller group, we used to just do like a, a focus group. You have one strong opinion, one leading voice, and then everyone will just sort of like follow suit. Like, oh yeah, what she said, right? Um, whereas if you break that up, you have more of those one-on-one, -on -one, those interviews, you group people differently, you can learn so much more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Joel, what are your thoughts on that? 
on how brands can talk yeah, to them. I, I have to tell you, I think Sonia was being nice when she said, um, if you were to line up right the the interviewer with kind of the population you might find oh you will find right i'll be bold. you will find mm -hmm. and so if you think about if you think about um the crafting of the questions right the the discussion the moment when you're face to face and then the interpretation yeah. right you've got three different levels here and if you're off by 20 20 20 degrees you're off by 60 degrees when you're all done. I mean, it, it's it's not helpful. And so you really need to um, make sure that you are uh, engaged with, with with members of that community to help you understand and, and, com and, and complete this process. Uh, it's just, um, we bring so many biases to the conversation and, and, and limitations in how we think that we're just, you're just gonna be better served by starting that way and, and you're blown away by what you're able to learn, right? So I, I couldn't, uh, Sonia's absolutely dead on. Michelle's absolutely dead on. Yeah. So how can brands approach their market research and indeed marketing um, from a place of authenticity? Because I've certainly seen a lot of brands go really off the mark. <laughs> how can they approach it more authentically? I, I think that there's an honesty moment where you have to go into a room and look everyone in the eyes and say, where are we doing false authenticity? Mm -hmm. It's totally a thing. Um, performative authenticity is a massive cottage industry built off the back of revolutions and concepts of race. And I mean, every way you can cut up the map. So I think that that's step one, kind of raising and rebuilding. I know it's not an incredibly popular thing to say in a boardroom is that we have to throw out everything that we've ever done in the way that we look at it. But if there, there's no better time for that than now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I might, I might, uh, I think Ellen and I are in the exact same place. I might use a little few different words. I think having that hard reality of where are we today, right? You have to start with where you're at. On a map, no matter where you want to go, there are two points that are important. Where are you and where do you want to go? And you have to have both of you can't make the journey. So I think that hard look in the mirror, that hard assessment of, of where, who are we today and who are we to our populations and what are those gaps? And everyone has gaps, right? And like to your point, and, and then what do we, what do we do with that? But most organizations uh, lack the, uh, at the individual level, at the leadership level, they lack that self-awareness to be able to have anything negative uh, be said or reflect or or it's only on the margins it, it, it's uh it's not authentic at all so anyway i, I think ellen and i were in violent agreement here yeah absolutely um thinking about brands recently taking a political stand i mean brands like patagonia have always uh been at the forefront of, of various movements but even b2b companies so just obviously this month salesforce have recently stated that they will happily support and fund the relocation of employees and their families out of texas if they wanted to um, which was interesting to see. Should brands be taking more political stands? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Sonia. So data shows that uh, consumers, I think 70% of consumers want to know that the brands that they are buying from align with their values. There are a number of different ways that you can demonstrate what your values are, uh, but it's important that you find a way that makes sense for you to communicate them in a way that doesn't feel performative, right? Um, so you wanna make sure that as there are different issues popping up in the world, that you understand when is the time to make a statement? Um, when is the time to uh, put a policy in place? And when is the time to, okay, this, doesn't apply to us. We don't necessarily have to comment on this uh, unless we feel like it impacts our employees or it impacts the customers that we serve on a broad level in some way. Figuring out what your stance is and having um, some guidelines in place that will help you identify what are the things that you need to say and when do you need to speak up is essential. There are benefits for brands figuring out a way to do some sort of advocacy for the issues that matter to them, and they can actually get a benefit um, in helping to uh, show the people or the consumers that they're serving that we are on the same side of issues. 
They don't always have to be something that's directly related to your brand, but if it's something that is very clearly connected to your values, um, then it does make sense to um, make sure that you find thoughtful ways to be able to say something, whether that is externally to your broad group of customers, or even if it's just something that's internal that you um, promote in some sort of policies um, with, with your team. Yeah, it's the, you're right. I think for a lot of B2B companies, it's definitely about the internal um, communication just as much as it's about the external communication mm -hmm. also. And those emails will always get leaked. And so that's the <laughs> other thing to watch. Um, we're going to pivot. We have about five minutes left. I'm just going to pivot a little bit into outside of market research, just human understanding. What trends have we seen in people, not consumers, people's needs changing over the last year and a half? Joel, I know you had a couple topics here. Yeah, I, you know, I think what's been interesting is uh, what we've all kind of gone through. And I mean all, I literally mean the globe. Like this is a one in a hundred year thing that, that kind of connects us. And and for the first time, I mean, populations sadly have felt threat for their lives for, forever. But, but the entire globe at one time, it doesn't happen that often. So what it's really, I think, helped us understand is... Um, kind of the humanity, the closeness, uh, the, the, the needs that we have for human interaction. And what's interesting is, you know, when you go back to kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we operate at that aspirational, inspirational level. We're all operating at the physiological level. I don't want to die. None of you want to die. And guess what? We had to face that for the last 18 months. And that that has profound implications on how uh, how we act, how we think, hopefully more how we act, right? Let's all be kinder and gentler to one another. Um, but I, I, I think those are really interesting things that we need to take stock of, reflect upon, and then authentically incorporate moving forward because we, we are either short or long term, we'll figure it out over time, but we've rewired a little bit. And we need to be mindful and thoughtful about that and, and meet the needs of what we have. Um, so... That's what comes to mind for me. Yeah, absolutely. And it'll be, it's not just a couple of years. This will be, it's an entire generation that Decorate. had this experience. And it will, it'll be 40, 50 years uh, to continue. Um, let's pivot to the future a little bit. I'd love to know um, as a final question, what does the future look like for insights professionals? Let's have a look at our crystal ball. Where do we see the insights industry going in the next kind of year, maybe five years? Uh, Michelle, would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, you know, I think we've talked a bit about about where we're headed and, and how we restructure or how we research. But what I think is really interesting um, is sort of the cultural and the public perception shift on insights and what we do. And there's um, there's a crazy amount of concern around personal privacy and data and and what all these big brands are doing. And it's this very um, it's looked at in kind of a malicious way, right? I mean, even even amongst everything that we've been facing over the last couple of years, where we should sort of all be, you would think, somewhat like on the same page, right? We're, we're all afraid for our lives, but at the same time, even something like this pandemic has been extraordinarily polarizing. Uh, and, and then we're tracking back how advertising and how social media and how manipulation has, has kind of caused a lot of that shift. I think everyone's seen the social network and, and what happened there. And so um, where I think that brands need to work on is when we do this research, when we when we conduct insights, um, it's not malicious intent, right? Um, none of us want to sell something to someone who doesn't want it. We're all in here to make people's lives better in some way. That's why we go to work every day and do what we do. There's, there's a, you don't feel satisfied in your work unless you feel like you're making people's lives better. And so, um, there's, there's, there does need to be some progress in understanding that um, when brands have your data, it's not necessarily such a scary thing. It's actually for your convenience. It's for your benefit. Um, and truthfully, I think there's so much obsession around um, personal information, whereas from from the inside the power is actually in aggregated data. It's not in personal information at all. If you think about how much data someone like Amazon has about you, Amazon knows what you're going to buy before you know what you're going to buy, right? At this point, they've got a million people with the same profile as you, and they know what's coming down the pike for you. Um, it's not, it, it, there's, there's not a, a privacy infringement there. This is just about
Let's make these, the, the purchases, the product recommendations, all of these things that we put in front of you, let's make it exactly what you want, exactly when you want it. So you can go out there and enjoy your time with your family and the things that you like to do, and you don't have to do all that work yourself. So um, that's where I let, really want to see some of that evolution is in the perception of what we do. Yeah, I agree with you. I made a joke on Twitter at Christmas saying something about thank you to the internet for scraping all of my friends' data. I know exactly what to purchase for all of them because it's just <laughs> throwing me ads all day. Unbelievably convenient. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I like, made it so easy. Uh, wonderful. We only have a, a minute left. Any last words of advice for our audience? Uh, Joel, we'll, we'll end with you. You know, I would say uh, rush to accelerate the democratization of the consumer, right? Everything we do, every business, everywhere is to try to better meet needs. And the best way we can do that is to unleash the customer to your higher organization, right? And I think that sets you up with kind of a, a constant platform of learning um, that allows you to accelerate and grow. And so that would be my advice, rush to democratize the consumer for everybody from wing to wing, top to bottom. Awesome, for the hippos and for the zebras. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Well, that is unfortunately all the time we have for today. I'm sure you could all agree we could have talked for about five hours and still not run out of things to, to talk about. Michelle, Sonia, Elliot, Joel, thank you so much for joining me today. This was absolutely fascinating. Next up, Susie's CEO, Matt Britton, will deliver an amazing keynote presentation all about the state of the consumer that you will not want to miss. Thank you to everyone for joining our session today.